how um, how things are going with our archives there. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I was trying to find, you know, as I said, I was trying to find the information on when um, Richter Kornbrooks, whatever, sort of ceased operation. And then I um, I just couldn't find it anywhere. So thanks for rustling that up for me. Yeah, yeah, sure. So JMT took them over or subsumed them? Yes, yeah, that's that's right, yeah. Oh, that's pretty, where's that? That is the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. Oh, wow. It's there, the steps inside. And I am now going to uh, hit the record button. Okay. Oh, we are recording. Okay, never mind. I am going to start. <laughs> Hi there, if you're just joining us, we're going to give it another minute or so uh, for people to filter in. Okay, welcome to week two of Doors Open Baltimore. This is Nathan Denny's Associate Director of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. First, a big thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support enables us to uh, organize Doors Open Baltimore for free every year. Uh, and a big thank you to this year's Doors Open Baltimore sponsors uh, and BAF supporters. And now just a few quick announcements. Uh, Doors Open Baltimore is just getting started for the month. We've got a whole month of uh, in-person and virtual programs this year. And this Friday, we'll be joining uh, the Irish Railroad Workers Museum for a presentation on Henry McShane and his bell foundry, which at its peak supplied 75% 75 75 of the country's church bells. And on October 13th, join us for a virtual presentation about East Towson, a historic African-American community unique to Baltimore County and the nation. And those of you uh, who attend our vir Friday virtual histories might recognize Meg Fielding. She has taken us on a number of architectural adventures around the region, including churches, schools, and municipal buildings. She is currently doing a deep dive on Palmer and Lambden for the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's Dead Architect Society, which is our architectural history committee. It's a pleasure to have her here today to present her research. And if this presentation gives you a taste for more Palmer and Lambden, you can head over to our website at www.palmarandlambden.com. If you have questions for Meg, please add them to the chat box. Okay, Meg, you can take it away. Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, I let me just share my screen really quickly. There we go. Um, so. I grew up in Roland Park and I've always loved the variety of the architecture that I saw there when I was a child and we would ride our bikes through the neighborhood or walk on the paths that are there. And, you know, just every house is a little bit different. So in my late teens, I had a great friend who planned to become an architect and we would talk about the houses that we loved and why we loved them. And as I grew older, I realized that there was a common thread running through all of the houses that I loved. And that was their sort of quirky nature. So fast forward to my involvement in the Baltimore Architecture Foundation and my introduction to Walter Shamu, who also loves Palmer and Landon. The Baltimore Architecture Foundation's Dead Architect Society is working to do deep dives into some of the early 1900s architects who helped shape our city and as my dead architects, I chose Palmer and Lambden. Palmer and Lambden worked mainly from the 1920s to the 1940s and proceeded to design more than 300 properties in Baltimore, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. Um, as Nathan, Nathan mentioned, I'm cataloging my finds on the website palmerandlambden.com. And there are details of many of their buildings there, as well as a catalog resume of the works that I have found so far. 
So first, let me introduce you to Edward Palmer. Um, he was an American architect, obviously, and he was the first architect hired by the Roland Park Corporation as their in-house architect. And um, he mainly designed houses in Roland Park, Guilford, Homeland, and some other planned neighborhoods, as well as the outskirts of Baltimore and throughout the Mid-Atlantic. And I'll talk to you about those um, in a little while. Um, in 1917, he went out on his own and opened his own office and almost immediately secured two really significant architectural commissions. And again, I'll talk about those in a few minutes. His partner for the majority of the time was uh, William Lambden. And he was a draftsman at Wyatt and Nolting, one of the other big architecture firms at that point. And then in about 1924, he went into partnership with um, Edward Palmer. During his tour of duty in World War I, he learned a lot about French architecture. And as you'll see as we go through this, um, he used it in many of his designs. Um, I love the quote that he said, the houses, the, he designed clients home distinguished by refinement of taste and simplicity of plan. Um, if you read his full bio, which is actually on the um, website, he was very interested in civic matters and served on a bunch of different commissions in the city, including the planning commission, where he would have had a fair amount of influence. So here's sort of the original and successor firms. So it started out as Edward Palmer. Um, he went out on his own in about 1917 and sort of just him until about 1925 when they had a partner very briefly who sort of, there's not a lot of information about. And so it became Palmer, Willis and Lambden. Um, and then Willis left and it became Palmer and Lambden. And then um, as sort of things moved on and I think Palmer died in 1945 or Lambden died in 1945. Um, they added some more partners and it became Palmer, Fisher, Ness et al. And that actually for the next sort of almost 30 years really had a lot of inter iterations like partners came and then they left and um, you know, they would change the name and then they would sort of change it again. And so eventually it was Ness, Campbell and partners. And then at the end became Richter, Kornbrooks, Gribble, um, was the sort of final successor firm. So um, a lot of places say, you know, basically it was the oldest, you know, ongoing architecture firm in Baltimore from um, 1917 to 2018 when Richter was acquired by JMT. Um, so it sort of ceases to exist, but if anybody's interested, all of the records are in the archives at the University of Baltimore. Um, they aren't open now, but they are sort of willing to help you find things. So there were certain characteristics of Palmer and Lambden's work. Um, they're sort of, you know, a tell. You can really, you know, when you see this, you're thinking, oh, that I bet is a, um, um, you know, Palmer and Lambden project. Um, so some of those are, um, let's see. So the mixed materials, um, stone, shingle, brick, patterns in the brick. So you can see here, um, this house actually is one of the best examples. It's got brick, it's got stone, it's got a turret, it's got a slanted roof. Here's another one with, you can really see the um, different patterns in the bricks. This one is a little more informal, but again, you see the mixed brick, stone, shingle. You've got the shingle roof that sort of comes down here. Again, you know, this is very, you know, the shingle roof is very predominant. And then this is one of their more formal houses, but again, you see the mix of the brick and the stone and sort of the different style windows. So, um, you know, when you look at these houses that there's these common threads running through them. The next thing is facades that sort of project and recede. Um, they did some sort of straight colonial houses, but not that many, but a lot of them, you know, sort of quirky like this one, you know, they've got this bit and, you know, it sort of moves. It's not completely flat across the front. This one, the entrance is recessed. So, the main thing is the, you know, this little set of windows here. 
this again, the entrance is kind of tucked back and, you know, sort of makes a little bit cozy entrance. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a, an interesting characteristic of their houses because it's just a little more unusual. Um, again, the varied roof lines. Um, and some of these pictures are old. They're from um, an old Library of Congress uh, Southern Architecture project. Um, so the black and white ones are from that and the colored ones are mostly mine. So you see, you know, how many roof lines are here. You know, just the, the peaked roof and then the sort of cut off and then um, this, you know, with these little sort of projections here. And then you see again, the sloped roof right here. And again, sort of coming back to this, this house that is the house that they literally threw everything at and um, it just has every characteristic. Another one of their characteristics is sort of the turrets, the dovecotes, um, just the other unique details that you generally do not see um, you know, in houses today. This house is down on Gibson Island and we'll come back to it in a little bit because it's another one of the houses they threw everything, you know, they just chucked everything at this house. Um, this house is over on Greenway and it's actually being renovated right now. So um, if you drive by it and you see a lot going on, you'll know it's all for the good. Um, this is a house that we'll talk about again um, a little later on. Um, and that's actually down in North Carolina. And this is also part of that property. So you see there's sort of a French influence, you know, you sort of have the, the peaked roofs, the turrets here, the little dovecoat here. This is a house in Homeland with another dovecoat. And you can see another one. This is over in um, Dumbarton near Pikesville, not Dumbarton near Rogers Forge, um, that you can see again, dovecoat, turret, you know, mixed materials. So, um, you know, as you drive around, look for those sort of tells in these houses. Um, one of their really favorite things to do was put casement windows in houses. Um, unfortunately, um, in many instances, the case, casement windows have been removed and replaced by sash windows. Um, and in one case, this is a house over on Wendover Road that just sold. Um, these are actually sash windows that have been sort of designed to look like casement windows. And um, I talked to the person who owns the house and they said that they're pretty sure that they're original to the house, um, but it gives you that feeling of a casement window, but the convenience of a sash window. And um, these almost look like replacement windows, but at least they've kept the style, um, which I, I gave them credit for. And then again, um, the entrances I think are always really interesting in these houses. Um, they really liked a corner entrance with a copper roof. Um, you know, just sort of some of these have a nice uh, patina on them. Um, so you can see it just sort of tucked in right there, you know, right over here. This house is on St. Paul Street. And I just think that's a really lovely corner, just, you know, kind of tucked in there. A lot of nice detail, um, you know, real thought to the process of designing this. Um, and then chimneys, they, they also like the good chimney. So, you know, Jacobean or diamond stacked um, brick chimneys. You can see the diamond stacks here. This is sort of an unusual chimney treatment for such a formal looking house. Um, these is so this little um, Tudor row over on Juniper with the nice big chimneys. Um, this one, very prominent chimney. Um, this is actually up in, I think, Wawa set, and I'll talk about that later in um, Delaware. Um, and then these elegant details that, that are characteristic of some of their houses, um, you know, a, a sort of regular architect might not have added this little bit, but just adding, you know, the shield here and then these details here really elevates the look of that house. It makes it, you know, just so much more elegant and gracious and great, graceful. And, you know, if you think about that house without those elements, it would sort of be pedestrian. Um, this, I love the attention, you know, with the downspouts here and this sort of echoing this. Um, this is over on, I think, Greenway, just um, before it goes into the St. Paul Street. Um, really simple house, you know, when you look it up, but then you start really checking the details and you see, you know, a lot of thought. This is the house down on Gibson Island that has 
details that are just so unbelievable. But this is, you know, really kind of an incredible little piece. Um, you know, this this a very simple doorway. You know, just couldn't be any just perfect. And then this little detailed event on top of it. And again, this door, which I hope you can see. Um, you know, it's a really great archway and then this little thing which I've never really figured out what it was I thought it might be for milk or mail if anybody has any ideas just put it in the comments and then again back to the roofs um one of the other lectures I did I think it was on Dundalk um Johns Hopkins said he would buy me drinks if I said uh um jerk and head roof so here's a couple of really good examples um this is in Dundalk um I think this is in um, maybe in Delaware. Here's another thing of the varied roof lines, really unusual roof treatment. Um, this is a country club down in North Carolina. And then just sort of the way this roof line splits off here and then sort of makes this. So it's sort of almost three in one in that, that little roof line. And both Palmer and Lambden spent time in Europe. Um, the Roland Park Corporation actually um, paid Palmer to go over to England and to look at the houses. And Charlie Duff has addressed a lot of this in his um, Green Cities um, lectures. And I think that's on YouTube, if you, the Architecture Foundation's YouTube, if you wanna see it. But so you'll see as we go through this, there, there's sort of four basic groups. It was um, England or the UK, uh, France, the Mediterranean, and then oddly enough, Switzerland. Um, and as I said, Lambden was already, we already talked about him being in France during the war. And so you'll see a lot of that influence um, as we move through this. So here's the sort of English style. You've got the nice Tudor looking. Um, regrettably, they painted this house some kind of unfortunate colors and it doesn't stick out as much as a Tudor, but um, you know, it definitely is that style. This sort of looks like, you know, it might be on somebody's old farm. This is definitely sort of Tudor manor style. And um, you can again see the Jacobean sort of um, diamond, pan, diamond um, chimneys. And then this house, um, this is actually a really early picture. It has not changed a lot, but I think that if you just use the slightest bit of imagination, you could really imagine this as a, um, thatch roof cottage somewhere in the Cotswolds and with a little sort of eye, eyebrow windows here. Um, but just, you know, that was, that was sort of one of their major styles. Um, again, you see the French influences here, you know, this could be a Normandy, this could be a Normandy, this I think, you know, could be some chalet down on the Loire Valley. Um, this again is the, this house on Gibson Island. Um, this is the front of it and this is the rear. And, you know, it's just really a, a big chunky, bit of a house, but just a lot of details. This is that window I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, you, know, you can see that sort of in situ, um, you know, and then this big tower on there. So you can look out over the bay. Um, so there are some pictures of this, the interiors of this house on the website. So if you're interested in seeing what it looks like inside, it's equally crazy as the outside. And this um, Mediterranean was another style they were very interested in. These two pictures are of um, Villa Pace up in the Green Spring Valley. Uh, you used to have a really good view of this house, but unfortunately there are a lot of um, pines that have grown up in the front of it. So you don't get as much of a view, but, um, and it's actually not a huge house. It, it's relatively small, but it's still just stunning nevertheless. Um, this is a sort of, you know, got some Mediterranean influences. This, um, you might recognize it's Roland Park Elementary and Middle School on Roland Avenue. And they built this in 1925 and it's very much Italian influenced. And it doesn't quite look like this anymore because they've added a huge section that sort of comes out this way um, on the front of this. And this is actually, um, one of my favorite of their um, sort of Mediterranean style buildings. Um, this is the Shrine of St. Anthony and it's up in um, Marriott'sville and it is a monastery now and Palmer and Lambden, when I was looking at their um, full catalog, um, 
when Richter Kornbrooks gave all the information to the University of Baltimore, I was going through and trying to, you know, match up addresses and things. And I kept coming across this one on Folly Quarter Road. And I'm thinking, what in the world did they do out in Folly Quarter Road? So I drove out there and discovered this monastery and sort of as the um, friars who are out there tell it, one of their members actually designed this um, after the shrine of St. Anthony in Padua, Italy. And then Palmer and Lambden probably did the drawings and the plans for it. Um, so, um, and if you don't know St. Anthony, um, he's also one of my favorite saints because he's the finder of lost things. So if you wanna hear the rhyme, um, I'll put it in the comments maybe, um, but it's, it's open to the public and um, there's also a really amazing old Carol Manor out there it's on the same property. So, you know, if you need something to do on a Sunday afternoon, take a ride out there and go check it out. And then these are the Swiss houses that um, Palmer designed one of them for himself. I think it is this one, but I'm not entirely sure because the way they did the address has changed. And these are at the very, very end of Longwood Road um, in Roland Park. And they actually sit below grade. In this house, I am standing on the street and taking this picture. So it's below grade. And then this picture um, on the bottom left is from Deep Dean Road. Um, you can see, actually just see a car right up here and I was parked right next to that car. So you can see, you know, how this drops off and why, you know, sort of a Swiss style house, you know, might make sense um, in the middle of Roland Park. But as I said, one of these um, was a house that he designed for himself. And this house, there's actually a public path that goes right along the side of it. So if you're curious to see a little bit more, you can um, look at the paths of Roland Park and figure out the one between um, Longwood and Deep Dean. So when Palmer left the Roland Park Corporation, he was asked by the um, US Shipping Company um, and Bethlehem Steel, to plan a development um, on the east side of Baltimore. It's a section of about a thousand acres. Um, it was farmland. It was actually part of, interestingly enough, a, a McShane Bell Foundry property um, because it was a smelting plant. And um, they asked him to design a neighborhood where the workers from the um, Bethlehem Steel could live. And so they wouldn't have to be commuting out from the city because um, there was a lot of dropping off when, you know, if somebody had to commute and they knew they had this, you know, commute that cost at that point 10 cents, you know, they wanted everybody to be there on time. They wanted it as easy as possible for the workers. So they built um, Dundalk and there are about 800 houses out there. There are only three or four basic floor plans that were used but the variety comes from the different roof lines. As you can see, these sharply pitched ones. Um, you know, this actually, this is a house in Roland Park and this is one in Dundalk. So they did use the same plan, but this house in Roland Park um, was a, was a um, duplex with two houses. Um, so one on either side. This one in Dundalk was actually four houses. So they made them a lot smaller um, to sort of have more, you know, have a higher density. So you can see this one is very similar. And then this is actually an old um, ad that I found of about detached houses. Most of them were semi-detached like this and there were a few detached houses, but you can see that it's not terribly big. Um, so once, um, you know, they got this settled. Um, Palmer got another call from the DuPont company up in Wilmington, Delaware to design another neighborhood, which is called Wawaset, which is in Wilmington. And again, you see very similar houses here to the ones in Dundalk and Roland Park. This I think is um, three houses, three or four, but you know, significantly bigger. The styles of the houses are all really unique. I think we saw this one back in the English section. You know, so the Grand Manor type house, you know, this has got some French influence. This is a little bit more sort of modern. And um, this again, um, a nice tutor with all the different kinds of bricks. Um, and the commission for this was um, a neighborhood, it's about six blocks and it's for the executives and scientists 
who were working at DuPont and they ranged from semi-detached to grand mansions and they were strict design covenants in Wawaset that still exists. So the neighborhood, except for the growth of the trees looks pretty similar to what it did before. So there were 50 townhouses, 56 duplexes and 101 single family houses in Wawaset. And, um, you know, again, if you have a spare afternoon, you know, on the weekend, uh, it's really worth going up and looking at this. It's got the same similar, you know, roads that, you know, sort of curve around. And so you can't go really fast. And, you know, you really, it's a great walking village. Um, and just the variety of types of houses. Um, they will be celebrating their 100th anniversary next year. And just sort of as a sort of odd coincidental aside, I got an email or a text from somebody, message from somebody saying, hey, I'm the person hired to put the um, website together for Wawaset's 100th anniversary. And I came across your Palmer and Lambden website and this is so great. And oh, by the way, I grew up across the street from you in Roland Park, so which was kind of funny. So Baltimore extends everywhere. So one of the things that Palmer and Lambden did, which I, I don't think a lot of people know about is they designed a lot of apartment houses around the city. Um, probably the most well-known one is the Roland Park Apartments, um, sort of in a French Chateau style. Again, you know, you see the really incredible brickwork. Um, this is one of the early pictures from it. Um, if you've ever been there, you know, it does have sort of this, you know, slightly, you know, privacy, you know, keep out, you're not part of us thing. Um, but it's really beautiful apartment building. Um, it's not quite an H shape, not quite L shape, but um, this right along here is this part here. And there's a really nice, um, you know, pond in the center. One of my great aunties lived there when I was a child and I just remember going in and looking in the pond and looking for all the fish. But it's very well thought out because they're diff each block of this has a different entry. And so you, you don't feel like you're going into this massive apartment building and, you know, walking down miles of corridors that, you know, it, it's sort of very intimate. You can see one of the entrances back over here. Um, this is the main entrance. There's entrances on either side, but you know, there's a lot of greenery. It's really nestled into the landscape because it's sort of right to the west of it, it really drops off into what is the Jones Falls Valley. But um, the apartments there are actually um, very nice, um, you know, big old apartments with dumb waiters and things like that. So it's, it's kind of fun if you see one that goes on the market, maybe make a chance to go over and check it out. And there's also a big car barn behind it, which is kind of interesting. Um, the Wyman Park Apartments are another big apartment that they designed right around the same time. Um, these are some of the old ads for it. Um, Wyman Park abuts the west side of the Johns Hopkins University campus. And you can see from this aerial shot, you know, really how enormous this is. And, um, but again, you know, you never feel like you're walking down miles of corridors because there are entrances sort of on the corners. Um, and there's, you know, obviously a main entrance, but, um, you know, sort of old fashioned, nice apartments, big rooms, wood floors, you know, detailing inside, um, you know, a lot of green space around them, unlike, you know, a lot of other apartment houses that are just sort of plunked down. Um, but if you're out and about, just go check that out. This is another one. This is um, St. Paul Court on um, in Charles Village, right across from the shops in, um, on Charles Village, right below 33rd Street. Um, Luckily, they've just renovated the whole thing. You can see this is pre-renovation and this is post-renovation. They've done a really nice job. And again, there's a big center courtyard in here. Um, I think that most of the people who live there now are students at Johns Hopkins. And I'm um, not sure if I'd wanna live there at this point, um, but it is a beautiful apartment building. And another one they did right in the same area is the Cambridge Apartments and the Homewood Garage. And this, I think, is now Woolman Hall at Hopkins, and it's entirely you know, owned by the university. But you can see just the sort of scale of this thing, you know, really big, but, you know, enough space for light and air to get into all of the apartments, you know, lots of sunlight. You can see the entrance. This is one of the smaller entrances here. Um, this is from the front, the fronting on um, Charles Street. 
And here you can see an early ad, you know, that really shows it with nothing in front of it because it's very hard to get a perspective on this now because um, the street there, I think it's 39, no, 30, 30 whatever street, I can't remember. Um, it's so close that you really can't get a good perspective of it. And when they built the Cambridge, um, they also built this garage here, which you can just barely see. And unfortunately now, if you Google Homewood garage, all you do is get the parking garages at Union Memorial or whatever. But um, for a garage, this is actually very, very attractive. And I remember this, um, they probably tore it down in the early 2000s, but I remember this was completely covered with um, Virginia creeper that would be bright green in the summer and then it would turn this beautiful russet in the fall. And um, it actually won some design awards in the, the early 20s for being like a modern garage. So um, again, it's a shame they tore that down because what's there now is nowhere near as attractive. And then this is the North Way on the corner of um, University Parkway and Charles Street. And it's a really massive apartment building. Um, but one of the nice things about it, it had all these terraces, which you can see. Um, and people who had these sort of big apartments also had this, you know, nice entertaining space. And it um, took a number of years for this to be built because the people who lived in Guilford were horrified that there was going to be an apartment house right on the corner of their neighborhood. And, you know, what kind of riffraff would it bring in and, you know, everything you know, just really kind of ugly. Um, I've written about this on the, um, the website and it was taken over. Um, there was actually a lot, a lot of problems with it. The landlord cut off all the heat and hot water at some point to try to drive the residents out because he wanted to sell it. And it was going to be a uh, um, senior living apartments. And then um, it eventually became student apartments. And if you can see this here, this is probably a two bedroom apartment that has now been converted into a four bedroom apartment. And um, they call it luxury student living, which kind of makes me a little bit ill. Um, and, you know, they have this one very small living space and, and somewhere in this um, plan, there's a kitchen, but I couldn't really ever figure out where that was, but they really just crammed, you know, each bedroom has a tiny little bathroom and, um, so they've, you know, if maybe there were, you know, 400 apartments now, they're, you know, four times as many. So, um, and the, there were a lot of problems when the students initially moved in there um, because the noise just bounces off of this building and the neighbors here were just, you know, furious. So I think they've really um, clamped on it. But the um, entry hallway, you know, the big lobby in this was apparently just spectacularly beautiful with big murals and everything like that. And it's just all gone, which, is absolutely a shame. Um, Palmer and Lamb, in, in addition to doing sort of residential, you know, projects in Roland Park, Homeland, and Guilford, um, did a lot of sort of one-off projects. And um, I'm going to show you a few of them. Um, this is their offices on St. Paul Street. Um, it's just south of Chase Street. Um, luckily, this has been renovated recently and looks a lot better than it has for a number of years. Um, this is sort of an old article about um, Art Deco and Art Modern in um, Baltimore. And you can sort of see, you know, the fluted columns here and the, the handrails. And, and fortunately, those still exist. And then you can see, you know, the casement windows, the, the steel windows. Um, and um, Lambden actually won a prize for the architecture of this building. Um, they said they're trying to, to rent it out again, but when you drove, drive by, it's right behind the Algonquin on um, Chase Street. So it really gets overshadowed and you don't see it as much. And there's also a high rise just to the south of it. So it, this poor little building gets you know, overshadowed by its, its much, much larger neighbors. Um, this is Sherwood House. It's out at Cromwell Valley Park in Delaney Valley. Um, it's a part of the park, but it's not a part of the park that they really highlight. They sort of more do the nature trails, but um, it's a Palmer and Lambden house. It's interesting, you know, it's sort of three parts. Um, funnily enough, this is the front door, but there's actually no way to access it, which is a little odd. Um, and then this is probably might have been a stable at one point, but, you know, nice garage. This was probably housing for the um, servants that they had that live there, you know, the cook and the 
Butler or whatever, um, who lived out there. But, uh, you know, it's just kind of a nice looking, you know, if you're going to live in a garage, it's kind of a nice looking place to live. And again, you know, you've got the dove coat here. And then as I referenced in the early slides, you can see the mixed materials here with the sort of shingle, the brickwork, uh, the stonework. This is all um, local stone um, from the quarries right around Cromwell Valley. Um, so uh, it's, it's open to the public, um, you know, there are hiking trails and things like that. And there's lots of activities, but the house was actually the thing that I was most curious to see. This is the Ashland School in Hunt Valley. Um, Palmer and Lambden didn't design this, this actually predates it. Um, it's from about the 1870s, but they converted it from a school to a private house. And um, it was on the market about two or three years ago. So I was able to grab some really good pictures, but you can see these you know, enormous windows and, and all the incredible detail in here and this little sort of ingle nook sitting area in front of the fireplace. And then this is like a little loft that looks out over the um, the main living room, you know, the nice paneled walls. Um, but I've always thought this was such an, an interesting project. All of the stone from this is from um, the Beaver Dam Quarry, which is just, you know, a mile or two away. It's Ashler Stone. So um, again, a, a very attractive, interesting, and unusual building. Um, but the conversion from a schoolhouse to, to a residence is, I think, really beautifully done. And you know, very, very English details in here. Um, this is the Garden of Remembrance at Druid Hill. It's um, really tucked away, so you don't see it that well, but there were trees planted after World War I for um, every state of the Union at that point. Um, there were 48, and fortunately, a lot of the trees still remain, but this is a plaque um, right in front of it. So, you know, there's a sort of a pathway that leads up to this building. And then you can sort of see where the different trees for the different states were um, planted. And, you know, this is sort of more of a labor of love, love project for them. And, um, you know, it's just, it's really off the beaten path that there's the parking lot um, sort of right over here. So if anybody's gonna see it, they sort of see it from the back and they don't really get the whole significance of, um, you know, this grove of trees and, and what they represent. And it's also in really, bad repair, unfortunately. Hopefully that will um, change soon. Um, as I mentioned um, with St. Anthony, the, the Shrine of St. Anthony, they did a number of religious projects. Um, so, you know, really had a broad base of what the, what things they did. So this is the monastery of St. Anthony in um, Howard County, sort of these cloisters here, the chapel, um, you know, originally designed to be very similar to the um, shrine of St. Anthony in Padua, Italy. And so this long corridor, um, as I said, you know, they, they do wine at the shrine every so often. So if you want to drink some wine and go look at a cool building, um, check out that. This is the Friends Meeting House on Charles Street. Um, again, this is another building that sort of gets overlooked because of, you know, you're usually trying to figure out what lane you're supposed to be in and I'm, am I turning or do my lane just disappear? So you really miss um, to see this little meeting house. And there's another friend's meeting house, um, maybe two or three miles up the road, and it's the Stony Run meeting house. But this is, you know, one of their projects. And, you know, very handsome, very simple, very elegant building, which is what you would expect from the, the Friends Society. Um, this is St. Casimir's in um, Canton. And the last time I was out at the Shrine of St. Anthony, the, the friar out there was telling me that um, not only did the guy who designed St. Anthony and um, Howard County designed that one. He also designed St. Casimir's and sort of under my breath, I'm like, no, he didn't, no, he didn't. So um, another really gorgeous church, um, you know, Baltimore's full of them. I should have added this to my church lecture, but I forgot. Um, but, you know, right in the heart of Canton, you know, it's really a landmark there. So easy to see. And then this is little St. Christopher's by the sea on Gibson Island, just this incredibly simple, small little church. It's um, not affiliated with the Episcopal church, but it's always had Episcopal services there, but I've been to a couple weddings there and they're always just beautiful. You can see the, sort of the wooden interior of the church, um, just a really lovely suite overlooking the um, bay at that point. And then here's some other places um, that they, um, designed, when I started writing the Palmer and Lambden website, um, 
got sort of these like over the transom emails from people going, oh, hey, I live in a Palmer and Lambda house in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm like, really? And, you know, the people do. So, and in New York, Pennsylvania, there's, there's a little sort of neighborhood that was called, it's called Wyndham Hills. It's on the south side of York. And there are about eight houses there. Apparently Palmer's brother-in-law lived there and um, he designed a couple of houses, but like a lot of Palmer and Lambton houses, they're set back off the street. So they're very hard to see. And I'm um, not really willing to get any trespassing charges against me. So I don't really have great pictures of them, but I have actually visited one of them. Um, somebody who had one of the houses invited me to come look. So I did, but I didn't take pictures because I didn't want to do that. Um, there are plans of one of the houses, which is what I'm actually using as the background for these slides. Um, so, but the first place is the Biltmore Country Club. I don't really know how he got that commission. I'm assuming there was a Baltimore connection someplace. Um, Walter Shamu was kind enough to go visit there and take pictures and give them to me. So these are, these couple are Walter's pictures. So you see, you know, some of their trademark you know, the turret, the slate roofs, the different roof lines, the, you know, the very English look. Um, this is the interior. Most of the pictures that there are of this um, country club are wedding pictures and obviously I didn't want to post those. Um, this is a house in Fayetteville, North Carolina and the person whose house this was got in touch with me and um, said, my grandparents commissioned um, Palmer and Lambden, Palmer Willis and Lambden at that point, designed them a house in Fayetteville. And um, it went out of the family for a number of years and I have just purchased it and we're renovating it. So he had the original plans, which you can see the bottom of here, just the, the mark. Um, so this is the front of the house. So, you know, this is a little cart courtyard, which you can see here. This is um, sort of a loggia out back. And this is the rear of the house. And um, it's really quite a beautiful house. He's really pleased that, you know, it's back in the family. And this is the little um, sort of barn, the car barn um, carriage house that is on the property. So it was very interesting to get these. And I've sort of kept up a correspondence with him. Um, he actually might be here today watching, hopefully. Um, and then this is the house that sort of, um, that was never built. Um, they had all the plans. Um, um, Olmstead did all the property surveying for this house. They designed the whole plan of it, everything like that. And the person who was building it got in a big fight with um, York County because they actually wanted to take some of the land that this guy was building the house on and use it for a reservoir for the city and got in this huge fight with them. And the house was never built, but you can see it was going to be a pretty spectacular house. There's sort of the, the, layout of it. I mean, it, you know, it goes over here and over here and then garages and, you know, this big forecourt. So you can see some of this. So it's kind of a shame that it was never built, but it's sort of an interesting story. And as again, you know, somebody just sort of sent this to me randomly and, um, you know, now I know a little bit about this. So, so here are some of my resources. As I said, the University of Baltimore archives, um, the architectural firm of um, Edward um, Palmer and Lambden and um, the successors, newspapers.com, which is what I use for um, a lot of the work I do here at my office. I'm the head of the history of medicine in Maryland. And um, here I've purposely misspelled um, Lambden because a lot of people add a B to it. And um, I, there were some things I knew they had done I couldn't find and I accidentally misspelled it and all of a sudden all this stuff popped up. So real estate ads from 1930 to 2021. Roland Park um, Gardens, Houses and People magazine, which was published from 1928 to 1960. So really in the formative years when um, Homeland and Guilford were being developed. Um, Walter Shamu, FAIA, the principal at SMP Architects, who was the person who originally got me interested in Palmer and Lambden, you know, as an architectural firm. Um, my website, palmerandlambden.com, and then Medusa, which is Maryland's cultural resource inventory, which is online and has a treasure trove of information. So that concludes my lecture. And um, oh, this is my favorite house, my favorite Palmer and Lambden house. Um, it's over on Giddings Avenue. You can't see it very well, hence the really horrible picture of it. Um, but these are some of the early pictures. But since I was a kid, and as I said, palling around with my teenage friend who lived right around the corner from this, um, and, you know, seeing this house a lot, that became one of the reasons that um, I originally wanted to become an architect. But obviously I didn't. So thank you so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box and we'll answer them.
Thanks, Meg. It's it's funny how sometimes when you spell something wrong, you find new stuff. You're searching those old newspapers. <laughs> you do. Yeah, so, I happened to be when I was researching Woodbury because some people spelled it Woodbury and found a whole bunch of new things about the neighborhood they would have never <laughs> found otherwise. Uh, but we've got some questions coming in uh, now and. Um, just a warning, my internet's a bit spotty here at the office. So Kevin, if you're here, uh, you can take over for me if I if I disappear, that'd be great. Uh, so first question. If Kevin, if Kevin wants to put up the website, the Palmer and Lambden one, um, did, you, did we talk about him? So anyway, go on. Yeah, so Kevin, if you could do that too. Um, first question is um, in Dundalk, if you wanna see the houses, what street are they on? And I'm gonna share a link to the, um, the Dundalk talk that we gave a, a few weeks ago, if you wanted to learn more about Dundalk. But uh, Meg, do you have any streets in mind? Yeah, they're they're called the Ship Streets. Um, if you go down um, to the main road into Dundalk, um, there's a little sort of village green kind of thing and they're all sort of back in behind that. But the strips, the, they're called the Ship Streets. So it's like Shipway and Friendship and North Ship. And, so each of the streets that are in the original development have ship in the name of them. So um, it's actually pretty easy to find them because um, if you just Google the ship streets in Dundalk. Great. So, yeah. And I think there's going to be a tour of Dundalk in a couple weeks, in a week or two, Nathan. That's that's right. Yeah, we're doing an in-person tour of Dundalk in a few weeks. Um, it's, it's currently sold out. But... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> but if, if, you know, there's always a chance that someone might give up tickets. So and if you're interested in that, um, you can email me and, and get you on a wait list, maybe. Uh, so I, I have a question for you, which is you showed that uh, image of their offices on St. Paul Street, um, which is a departure from a lot of the styles you showed, which, you know, you had like the, the old like English uh, influence and European influence. And so like now we're seeing this more like streamlined modern style. And my understanding was that that building was designed by Charles Ness. Can you talk a little bit about like his influence on the firm and the direction that they went in after um, after Palmer and Lambin's time? Not really as much. I know he was more of a modernist. Um, that building was definitely designed by Lambin. He won an award for it. It's mentioned in his obituary. It predates the time that I think Charles Ness came on board um, into the firm. So you know, there's a lot of information that links that directly with Palmer and Lambden. They also did another sort of modern building over on Charles Street. It was a hair salon called Carl's. And um, if anybody's sort of old Baltimore, it, Carl's moved out of there in 1968 after the riots and moved um, sort of a little farther up Charles Street and then eventually across Keys. And I think it's still in business, but it's a very modern building. It's right. I think it's Red Maple, if um, I don't even know what the name of the bar is now, but it used to be Red Maple, but it's right um, near um, where the manor is, um, the former brass elephant, Nepal, I think is there. So right across from the Maryland Club's parking lot, um, it's one of the buildings there. And actually, if you look on the website and just um, search for Carl's, it'll come up and you'll see it's m much more similar to the their offices than any of the other buildings. So they did do a couple you know, non-traditional buildings. So more modern, um, so, but yeah, I just, you know, I don't know a lot about the Charles Nass era. I sort of pretty much stopped with Palmer and Lambden. So. Uh, yeah, that, that building, I think it used to be called Sangria. Now it's something else. It's like, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's, it's a lot of things. A bit, or maybe that's a different place. I, I can't remember now. Um, but one, one thing that I was, uh, another architect I was thinking about while you were presenting uh, was um, Lawrence Hall Fowler, who was also working in, in um, the same neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. He did work with like, Guilford and Roland Park. Um, also was taking some similar influences. And I hope that you could say a little bit about like maybe like did they have a relationship or you know like can you talk a little bit about like like why like this style became so popular um, in the early 20th century? I think because, you know, well, prior to 1929, um, there was a lot of money. People wanted really, you know, fancy houses. Um, they were really making, you know, these three neighborhoods, Guilford, Homeland, and Roman Park be sort of, you know, if you're not going to have a townhouse in the city, then, you know, you have this house just at that point. Um, 
some of the Roland Park, at least at the very beginning and until the 1918 was in the county. So it was, you know, just the style of houses then. Um, I always think Lawrence Hall Fowler's houses are much more formal than Palmer and Lambdon's, which I think are definitely, as I said in the title of this, I mean, they're very quirky. They're, you know, they've got these funny little, you know, you saw the little angle nook seats in front of the fireplaces. You see, you know, some of the really unusual features, the dove coats and the turrets and things. Whereas I think Lawrence Hall Fowler is more formal as far as I, you know, as I think so. Um, you know, just a different style. And, um, but you definitely see the influences of the time, you know, with all of them. You know, Matu and White and um, Guilford, again, their houses are very formal, you know, um, Georgian, you know, colonial, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, they really, Palmer and Lambden really didn't do Lawrence Hall Fowler, um, big architect here, just answering a question. Um, you know, they really didn't do you know, very many Georgian center hall colonial kind of things. That just wasn't, you know, what they were doing. Yeah, I, yeah, I might have, I might have clarified who, who he was. He was another yeah, big Baltimore architect of that of that time. He designed the um, the War Memorial Building down across from City Hall, and also worked on. Um, he'd been up to the um, Evergreen Museum. He he uh, did a lot of the renovations for that building too. Um, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions, and it's uh, already twelve fifty. So Oops. I think we can we can wrap it up. So, well, thanks everybody for coming. And um, if you have any questions, um, you can send them to me through the Palmer and Lambden website. There's a link to uh, my email on there, and um, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of information. I think I've done almost a hundred um, different posts on houses, um, Palmer and Lambden houses. So thanks for coming and we really appreciate it. And um, go look at the rest of the schedule for doors open because it's really great this year. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.